If you've got a Bible with you and you want to follow on in the Bible, you can turn with me to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to be in chapter 10 today. We're going to be in two scriptures, so we're going to test your Bible knowledge this morning. Hebrews chapter 10 to start with, beginning at verse 19. This is what it says. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and a living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some of us are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And if you want to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians now, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll begin at verse 21, no, not 21, sorry, 12. This is what it says. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized one spirit, so as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honourable we treat with special honour, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that have lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part of the body is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. And God has placed in, his ch in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, of different kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have the gift of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the scriptures that we've heard read out. And we recognize, Lord God, that in many ways, these are the ideals that we want to aspire to. And in so many ways, we fall short. But we thank you, Lord God, that you call us to persevere to be the people that you want us to be. And as Zoe comes to speak to us now, Lord, our prayer is simple. Open our ears to what you might have to say to us as a church and open our ears to what you might have to say to us individually. May we be encouraged, may we be challenged, may we be edified, may we be spurred on to be the people that you want us to be, and walk the way that you call us to walk. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
Thank you, Luke. This morning already, before I speak, we've been challenged in the way that we're sat, in the way that we're doing things differently. And thank you for going with it. Because this morning, as I come to help us think about how we are to be faithful in fellowship, how our walk with Christ is a walk with others, there really was only one way for us to sit. Sit in a way where we can see who is on this journey of faith with us. And that's our heart behind why we are like we are today. But so far in our series entitled Distinctive Discipleship, we have considered how our walk with Christ is going, how we are abiding with Christ, how we are remaining in him, how we are following him, how we are covered in the dust of our rabbi. And so far, we have discussed how our walk with Christ is doing. And when we sit in our rows on an ordinary Sunday, we're often sat, aren't we, facing the altar, thinking about how I'm doing with God. And today, sat like this, we're considering how are we together walking this road of discipleship. And we are centering our time and attention this morning on the one thing that communes us together, on the one thing that we all have in common, this community meal that we are going to take together as we participate in communion later. So our heart and our prayer for this morning is that we would be centred on Jesus, that none of this would be about us, that this would all be about who he is, that he would be the centre of us as a community that he would be the centre of our worship, the centre of our time and our relationship with one another. And as we think about these verses in Hebrews and think about what Paul is encouraging, how Paul is encouraging us to function like a body, in all of it, my prayer is that Jesus would be honoured, that we would see again him as the supreme centre of who we are and who we are following. I don't know if any of you have been to Salisbury Cathedral, I can't say I have been, but my mentor loves the place and she loves it because of the way the cathedral is set out. And I have a picture to show you and maybe you'll understand why we're sat the way we're sat. But in this magnificent place, the altar is in the middle. The very reason for the magnificence, the very reason for the incredible exterior of the building, the one that you worship is the center of it all. And this morning, if you take anything away from what I'm going to share, that is my heart, that Jesus would be the center of it all. And the thing is, when you sit in a cathedral like that, you're not looking forward, you're not thinking one directionally, because when you're sat in a, in a, in a theatre or kind of a cathedral like that, you see the others that you're sat with. And that's where we're getting at this morning. As we think about how discipleship isn't just about our walk with Christ, but it's about who we are walking with. In those verses in Hebrews, we are encouraged to not forsake meeting together. We, encu- we are encouraged to be encouragers to spur one another on. And before we kind of hone in on this morning, these verses in Hebrews that tell us to not forsake meeting together, spur one another on, and be encouragers, I want us to zoom back and think about what is the letter of Hebrews all about? Why is the writer encouraging the people to remain faithful and encouraging the people to to continue on meeting together? Then we're going to hone in on those verses, consider what Paul encourages us to function like a body, and then ask together today, who are we? Who are we walking this journey with? And how can we be people that spur one another on as we hold fast to the faith that we profess in Jesus? So my encouragement as I speak this morning is to look around the room. Who is here? Who are you walking this journey of faith with? But as we zone in on Hebrews this morning, what do we know about the letter of Hebrews? We don't know the audience. We don't know specifically the community that the author is writing to. But we do know that they have a faith in Jesus because the encouragement is for them to hold on to their faith. So they have a faith. 
And we know probably that they have a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. How do we know that? Because the writer often points back to the story of old, encouraging them to keep going in their story. And we get a sense of why he's communicating to the Hebrews community, why he's communicating to them. If we read a further ahead a little in the passage that Luke has shared for us, if we read on, we learn about the the persecution and the suffering that they have endured. So if you're following in your Bibles, or if not, it's going to appear on the screen again. We're just going to pick up from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32, and learn about why the Hebrew community were being encouraged to hold on to their faith and to not forsake meeting together. It says, remember those early days after you have received the light. So remember the days when you had just heard about Jesus, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecutions, and at other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence, for it will be richly rewarded. What do we learn about this Hebrew community? We learn that they were suffering, that they were being persecuted, that their possessions were being confiscated, that their confidence was dwindling. And here we understand today much more about the verses that we're going to study together because he is communicating into a hurting group of believers who are giving up on their faith, who are enduring suffering. And it's kind of like a pastoral exhortation that says, come on, guys, hold in there. Stand firm in your faith. Do not stop meeting together. Why? Because Jesus is worth it. And how can I make that claim this morning? Because we know in Hebrews, or if we read it, we'll understand for the first time that this letter is littered with warnings, saying, Jesus is so much better than you realize. Hold fast to your faith. As well as these warnings, we kind of see a sandwich of theology. Who is Jesus? The Hebrew writer says that he's the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact imprint of God's nature. He is the high priest. He is the ultimate sacrifice. So in these opening chapters of Hebrews, we kind of see Jesus' list of achievements. And we see the writer elevate him one better every time. He is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. So do not rebel like the Israelites did. Do not harden your hearts. He is better than the priests of Aaron, Jesus born from the line of Melchizedek. If you reject Jesus, the writer is telling the community, then you are rejecting the one and only sacrifice, the one way that you will ever have a relationship with God. So right from the outset, we understand the communication is that Jesus is supreme. Do not walk away. The writer tells us that Jesus is so worthy of our full devotion that he does require all of us. He says, hold fast to your faith, persevere. Do not walk away from the community of believers that you find yourselves in because they're going to hold you unswervingly to your faith. Don't walk away from your faith. Don't walk away from the community because Jesus is worth it. And although when you read Hebrews, sometimes the warnings feel quite harsh, we understand that this is communication with a pastoral heart. I want you to hold fast to the faith, hold fast to the community, because if you don't, the other options aren't that great. Jesus is the only way. So that's the backdrop from the few verses that I want us just to pick up on again. And we've had the scripture read, and we're just going to see it again on the screen if you're following along Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Because what I want us to see together is if the writer is so convinced that Jesus is the only way, 
that Jesus is supreme, then what is it that we are to do? And in the passage, we get this kind of indication on what's, what is it for us to do? Because we see the command, let us, three times. It's not an individual command, come and follow me. Instead, what's the collective response of all of us? Let us together follow Jesus by, should we read it? Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. What else are we to do? Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And then it goes on to ask us to be encouragement, to be encouragers to one another. So what is it that we are to do today? Let us hold unswervingly to the faith and the hope that we profess in Jesus. Let us spur one another on and let us not give up meeting together as we are provide encouragement to each of us that are in the faith community together. And it's almost as if the Hebrew writer answers his own question. How do we hold to the faith that we profess in Jesus? How do we persevere when the suffering that we are enduring feels too much? The Hebrew writer tells us that we are to be a part of a community that holds us, that we are to be part of a community that encourages us, that spurs us on in our faith. And what it talks about is how some of them at the time were breaking away from meeting together. And what we get a sense is how strongly the communication is that they should not do that because there's a link between not meeting together and not carrying on in the faith. Some of them are breaking the habit of doing it. It's no coincidence that in COVID we found ourselves kind of, as a result of that time of not meeting together, feeling discouraged, because as this, it shouldn't be a surprise to us from what this Hebrew writer is communicating, that there's a link between meeting together and being encouraged in our faith. Luke pointed out a few weeks ago that through this time of COVID, as a result, what's happened is in the church in general has seen kind of a decrease in discipleship. And although there were ways that we tried to meet together, it wasn't the same, was it? And over that time, we either formed new habits or we gave up on habits that we had in the past. And I've had lots of conversations with people after COVID and some of them are good and some are bad about how we've refilled our time, I guess, as a result. So I just want us to pause a moment and take to reflect on what is a habit. How do habits change? How do habits form? And I was kind of reading around this idea that it takes 66 days to form a habit. And apparently the one kind of factor for what changes a habit is how sold out for the cause we are in the first place, whether we want to see the results really in our lives or not. And through this study of how you form or how you break habits, the one thing, the one factor of what it makes you to be more successful in building a habit in the first place was consistency. If you do something over and over and over again, you're more likely to build that as a habit. Now, in lockdown, I'm sure like lots of you, like me, I tried to become healthier. I tried the habit, well, I tried to form a habit of running. And I'm not a runner, and I tried the Couch to 5K app. I don't know how many of you have done that. But what it's very good at doing is breaking down this massive task of sitting on your sofa at home to eventually running a 5K in less than 30 minutes. And it does it in a really manageable way where you... Uh, run for a bit, walk for a bit, run for a bit, walk for a bit. But as I started this, we started it as a family. So at the very part of lock, beginning part of lockdown, I went home. For some of you, you'll remember, my dad was in a care home at the time and the first wave of COVID saw the home kind of ravished 
with COVID. So my dad was really unwell. We had 24 hours to pass away from COVID. So we were sent home to go and say goodbye to him. As a family, how do you cope with that? You start running. Well, that's what we did as a family anyway. So we started running laps around the field next to my mum's house, the football club that my brother plays for. Together with other people, running started to be fun. But then, incredibly, my dad remained well, survived COVID, and I came back to Plymouth and back to work. But in that time when we were at home as a staff team, every morning, we'd Zoom together and pray like we normally do at half nine. And we were praying in the morning and just checking in on one another. Some of us were working, some of us weren't. And some of you will know Abby. She's our office administrator and she's on maternity leave at the moment. And during that time, she was doing the, the couch to 5K with her husband. And every morning, she'd give us a little update on how it was going. When I say she'd give an update, she'd answer Luke's questions on how was it going. And every day, he'd faithfully ask, how's the running? But I decided to stay silent. I decided not to tell the team that I was doing this running at all because I didn't really want the news to get out. But I came back to Plymouth and running on my own was really, really hard. I tried to run a few times and I was just giving up on this. But one day I was busted. Gemma saw me out for a run in Central Park. And I'm bright red when I go running and it's not an attractive look. But I said to her, or I tried to get the words out, please don't tell Luke that I'm running. Because I really didn't want this news out because then I'd have to finish the couch to 5k then I'd have to persevere and go for it cut a long story short it's a nine week program it took me 18 months to complete it and I did and I did and I remember completing it because I ran my first 5k the day before my brother's wedding and the reason I managed it was my brother-in-law ran with me the whole time and he kept me going and he encouraged me and we tried to have conversation I couldn't really breathe but <laughs> I remember it because the next day was my brother's wedding and I was so stiff, I couldn't move. <laughs> and I was, yeah, anyway, so not recommending that. But my point of this was that if I told the staff team when I came back to Plymouth, it probably would have taken me less than 18 months to complete it. My not really wanting anyone to know that I was running, obviously the truth did come out and I've told them the whole story. And that's one thing my mum does say about me a lot. I, the truth will always come out. But you need other people in your life to help you with things. Because I didn't have any accountability. So I could come home from work one day and go, I'm not going to run tonight. Hence why it took 18 months to complete. So we need each other. And when we're thinking about forming healthy habits in our lives, if that word is consistency, if that's what it takes to form a habit in the first place, then what that I learned from that brief encounter I had with running is that you need others to help you. That you have to break the task down and it's okay to fail. I've been reading around this theme recently that it's okay to be an amateur. In my personality type, I love to be a pro. If I'm good at something, then I'll do it. If I'm not very good at it, then I'll try and leave it alone. But what I've been reading is it's okay and there's freedom to be an amateur. In our culture, it says we have to go pro at everything. We have to be the best. I'm not a runner, and that's okay. And it, when we think about being part of a community, it's okay if we're failing. It's okay to be honest and share that, but we need to let other people in to help us in the first place. If you read more around habits, you'll understand that we are all, one, creatures of habit, but two, Psychologically, we love the law of the least effort. That's what it says. We will always choose the easy option, the law of the least effort. Many, many nights over that 18 months, I said no. But in, if we think about this in the framework of Hebrews, the writer is saying, he's speaking against the law of the least effort. They wanted to give up, and he said, no, you really, really can't, because Jesus is worth it. It's easier to walk away sometimes. The law of the least effort says, I won't go today, or I won't share this, or I won't bother someone, I won't, I'll manage this on my own. But if we think about that second reading for a moment, where Paul is encouraging us that we are part of the body that we need each other to function, that if one part of the body 
is not able to function or is weak or is hurting, then the rest of the body feels it. He doesn't value one gift over the other. He doesn't value one person over somebody else. Each person, each part has a role in the body to play. The law of the least effort says not today, but the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is worth it. Let us consider how we are to hold fast to our faith, unswervingly the Hebrew writer talks about, so that we can remain faithful to the one who is faithful to us. We need each other to encourage us. We need each other to spur us on. We have to invite people in and we have to remember that we don't function as a body if some of us are missing or if some of us aren't letting others in. I want to also share a few verses from earlier on in Hebrews that points to us having a great confidence in who Jesus is. Because another theme in Hebrews is that we are to have confidence. Confidence in our relationship with God. Confidence that we can approach him. The verses again tell us to draw near to Christ with a sincere heart. Because we've been cleansed. We have that access. The writer is telling us to persevere and to have confidence. And I think being part of a community means that we need confidence in one another as well as confidence in God. It's Hebrews chapter 4, if you want to turn back with me. Let me find it so I can read it to you. I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Jesus, the great high priest. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We are to draw near to God with confidence. We are to have confidence in those who are walking with us that they will hold us when faith is, when we are floundering in our faith. So I wonder today how confident you are Confident in the one that we get to draw near to, knowing that he is faithful to us. And confident that you are part of a community that will hold you, that cares for you, that will encourage you and is here today spurring one, well, spurring you on as you spur others on. Because what I've really realised this week as we think about this passage in Hebrews and this passage where Paul tells us that we are part of a wider body is that you cannot have encouragement in isolation. You cannot encourage or feel encouraged on your own. Like Paul talks about, the hands can't function without the foot. You can't encourage somebody if you're on your own. And the thing is, we all need encouragement, don't we? Whether we've had a faith in Jesus for years or whether we're new to our faith, or encouragement to try Jesus to begin with. So I wonder today how encouraged you are feeling. Who has encouraged you recently? How has encouragement, like my brother-in-law's encouragement to keep running when I wanted to stop, helped you when you needed it the most? Today's message is simple, really. Our walk with Christ is not just about our walk with him. It's about our walk with others. And the the thing that I think is astonishing when you read the Hebrew account of do not forsake meeting together is the writer was strong about this. The same verb that is used 
in this context today, do not forsake, do not stop meeting together, is the same verb that Jesus used on the cross when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The same emphasis that is given, if you walk away from the faith, you walk away from a community of believers, is the same as saying, I'm abandoning my faith. That's what the writer really wanted you to understand. If you walk away from the community, then that will be fatal to your walk with me. So I'm just going to finish by asking some questions. And I wonder today how encouraged you are feeling. Who you have encouraged in the life of the church recently. When we are talking about habits, what habit have you maybe given up on? How have you grown weary, whether that's in your own walk with Christ or whether that's in your walk with others? Where today might you be lacking confidence? Confidence in God, confidence in the church. Where today is God asking and calling you to persevere, to spur someone else on and to come back to him? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the confidence that you give us, the confidence that we can approach you and your throne because of what your son Jesus did, the great high priest, we can have a relationship with you. But I thank you today that this very way that we are sat demonstrates that our walk with you isn't just about me and you. Lord Jesus, it's about who you are asking us to walk this journey with. And I just speak confidence over our church community that we would grow in our knowledge of who you are, Lord Jesus, and we would grow in the knowledge of where you have planted us, who you have given us as a gift of encouragement to walk with. Lord Jesus, where there has been isolation, we pray for your encouragement. Where we have given up at times on our walk with you and our walk with others, today would you bring new life? And would you give us the eyes to realise that we are not alone, that we can draw near to you and to others? Father God, we thank you for the encouragement in your word that we are part of something bigger, that our walk with you does matter. And I pray that we wouldn't be people of the law of the least effort. Instead, Lord Jesus, we would put in the sacrifice where it's needed to be part of your body here in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.